Good afternoon. Thanks for being here. As you know, over the last few weeks, I've been pretty critical with the direction the legislature seems to be heading. And to be clear, I'm still very concerned with the budget in particular, as well as other initiatives with big price tags. Even though I propose a path to achieving those goals over time without hurting the very people we're trying to help. But today, I want to point out a few areas where we agree, which hasn't gotten as much attention. Because as I've said, we actually agree more than some would think. And when we don't, it's usually about the how and what pace we're on to get there. You've all heard me talk about workforce development a lot over the last six years and the need to grow our workforce given our demographic challenges. The budget I proposed in January focused on those challenges and the House agreed with much of what we proposed and then added a few ideas of their own. Here are a few examples of agreement. <clears throat> they included money I proposed for refugee resettlement, helping those seeking a new life in our state transition into the workforce. They supported millions for the Vermont training program to help workers move up and upskill Vermont, which helped those wanting to attain professional certifications with free courses. And they fully funded our VSAC trade scholarship program, which will help put folks on a path to get the skills they need for the jobs we need. Now, what they didn't include were my initiatives to make Vermont more affordable, but we'll save that one for another day because today I want to highlight our areas of agreement. So I also want to thank the Senate for working with my team on the public safety and school safety packages. And while we haven't gotten everything we asked for, I appreciate their willingness to work with us to find solutions. I believe public safety is a shared priority with legislators, and we've made progress. The Senate has also worked with us on the forensic bills, helping advance initiatives and stabilize our system of care. And I appreciate the House for also supporting our mental health initiatives, including funding our mobile crisis response and mental health urgent care services, programs our communities want and are in desperate need of. I also want to take a minute once again to thank the Senate Economic Development Committee for their work on S-100, the housing bill. We were supportive of this bill when it came out of committee. And although I'm concerned that most of the Act 250 provisions have been watered down, it still gives us a strong foundation to work from in the House, where we hope to restore what was removed. And the fact is, we have to. Many legislators ran campaigns based on solving the housing crisis. And Vermonters should know, Act 250 reform is necessary to do so. As I've said, if the legisla legislature fails to act, then they aren't serious about making real progress on housing. These are just a few examples of where we found common ground uh, thus far this session. And I'm hopeful we can continue working together to find consensus. I know there will be times when we're just not going to agree, especially when it comes to adding more taxes and fees and just spending instead of investing money. And I also know some in the majority party want to frame the debates we're having on childcare, paid family leave, climate action, and others as we're for it and the governor is against it. But that's simply not the case. And I get it. It makes uh, political messaging a little more complicated when we agree on the goals. But there is a path forward. And for the record, I'm a willing partner, which is why so many of my proposals began with trying to meet the legislature where they are. I firmly believe we can achieve universal access to paid family and medical leave. We can make historic investments in childcare, helping thousands more families access affordable options. 
We can act on mitigating climate change. We can create housing for homeless Vermonters. We can expand treatment and prevention for opioid addi addiction and mental health needs. And we can do all of it in a way that doesn't increase costs on already overburdened and overtaxed Vermonters and without setting us up for serious and very real fiscal problems in the future. I truly believe we can get the outcomes we all want if we work at it. So with that, I'll open up the questions. Governor, some of your um, fellow colleagues and governors in other states have announced plans to start stockpiling mifeprestone, the abortion medication, um, in contention in the court in Texas and the Fifth Circuit now. Are, are you pursuing any sort of similar plans? We have, uh, we have contemplated that, and um, we have conferred with uh, the AG's office, uh, for one, uh, and we've also been in contact with uh, uh, Planned Parenthood uh, to seek advice. And uh, at this point in time, I think uh, the consensus is we should wait until Friday and see what happens before moving forward. So I spoke to uh, a couple of other governor's offices in the uh, Northeast to see what they're doing. And I think we all agreed, why don't we just wait and uh, see what happens, and then we'll, we'll go from there and uh, see what, what uh, we need to do. My understanding of this whole situation at large is that state governments are pretty limited in how they can respond and what they can do. I mean, if there's a, a nationwide injunction on access to this medication, Vermont can't single-handedly keep it legal or what have you. I mean, how does it feel to be sort of constrained in this situation? Well, we do, I mean, first of all, um, the FDA, uh, I don't believe the Biden administration is going to let the FDA, uh, prevent the FDA from uh, supplying states with the needed medication. Uh, secondly, uh, I think we're in a somewhat unique position here in Vermont. Uh, we are one of three states who have sought uh, to be able to purchase uh, drugs uh, in Canada, uh, ourselves, Colorado, and Florida. And so we're just waiting for approval um, from the feds to do so. Um, now might be the time when they give us the green light instead of uh, having us wait at the intersection. So um, there are some alternatives uh, that are, again, maybe unique to Vermont, but I think we're going to be okay. But we'll see. We'll see what the decision is on on Friday, um, we agree with the other states uh, in terms of uh, the decision in Washington, and so we'll just have to see where we go from there. I'm not familiar with um, the the plans to purchase drugs from Canada. Can you explain a little bit more how that we, would work? We, uh, along again with uh, two other states, had and this started a couple of years ago, I believe, um, and we we've asked. Uh, this was based on, um, I guess, some of the dialogue that we've had. Uh, I think Senator Sanders has been working on this for a long time, and we decided to try and move forward. So we sought approval from the federal government to do so. And uh, they are considering uh, what we're proposing. And again, we're one of three states who uh, have at least gotten past go on this and uh, are in the are in the middle of uh, maybe negotiations and so forth. It seems to be stalled out. But again, this could be a way uh, to obtain that, uh, that particular drug in Canada. Governor, you mentioned um, the state assisting refugees, certainly in your budget. I know there has been an influx of refugees at the northern border in New, in New York and in Vermont. Um, you know, what, what services do you see, maybe Commissioner Morrison can chime in too, but what, what services do you see the state providing for some of these individuals coming to Vermont? And at what point do you see maybe some of those services becoming straight, if at all? Well, what we're seeing at this point, and, um, and I might ask uh, um, maybe some others to, to weigh in on this as well, uh, but what we're seeing thus far is they're coming across into the state and then they just transfer to other states. They're just, we're just a pathway to other states. 
Uh, I would like to see some consider Vermont, to be honest with you. I mean, considering our demographic challenges and workforce issues, uh, we might need uh, some folks. We do need uh, some to stay. So, um, but thus far, it hasn't been a, a long stay for any of them um, at this point. But we've uh, we have been anticipating this for a while, um, just in case a type of scenario. So, we have um, we have some plans moving forward if we if we get somewhat overwhelmed. Um, but I don't see that happening at this point, especially with the action uh, taken by Canada and the U.S. with uh, President Biden and uh, um, uh, Prime Minister Trudeau uh, in their agreement to come on, somewhat close the border off. Can, can you maybe expand a little bit about what those plans look like? Well, again, um, we've, we're considering some of this when uh, if you, as you recall, it may have been a year ago, maybe less, uh, when uh, there were some southern states who were busing uh, and flying uh, some of the migrants to other states, and we weren't sure if we were going to uh, be targeted uh, as well. So we wanted to be prepared for that. So again, we worked together with our labor department, our um, uh, agency of human services, public safety, and so forth, and we're just trying to anticipate if this happens, what are we going to do? We didn't want to be surprised. So we put a plan together. Uh, I don't have the details of that, but, but we've considered uh, a number of different options. Anybody else want to say anything more? Secretary Samuelson, is there anything I should add to that? Mr. Morrison can weigh in. Um, as we've contemplated, it's only a trickle of folks coming in now, um, but services that we've looked at are housing, food, sheltering, those types of services. But for right now, folks are really coming into the state um, and needing assistance with transportation um, to, their, to their goal location. Uh, just coming back to the potential or the pending decision on my Bristone. Um, so you agree with the eight, the actions the AG has taken uh, in recent? Yes. Okay, you do. Just want to make sure. Yeah, I mean, this is, I think it's an FDA decision. It was made a long time ago, and I don't think it's for the court to decide, but that's just my opinion. I'm sure that they will have uh, their legal disagreements on that, and we'll see it play out over the next few days. Are you concerned about the precedent that this, if um, the Texas judge's um, decision stands, I mean, I've heard concerns of people saying, what if district judges now are given the power to overrule FDA decisions for other medications they're politically opposed to, say vaccines or you know, medications that use certain research methods and R&D? Are, are you worried about that too? Yeah. Yes, I am. I think it does set a precedent and uh, I'm concerned about that. Governor, as you've seen, there's a, a big um, rally today on the State House lawn, maybe north of two, 300 people. We don't know. But you, you of course, as you mentioned, have outlined your vision of, of child care, bolstering uh, subsidies, and, but not raising taxes or new fees. The, the pro tem and the speaker are both out there. This is a big priority of theirs. I mean, have you had any additional conversations with them or Chair Kornheiser or anybody else regarding the current child care proposal and where it stands? Well, they seem to be fairly uh, far apart uh, between the House and the Senate, to be honest with you. Uh, so they haven't even come to agreement. Uh, but the, uh, the leadership is fully aware of my stance on this and our proposals. Uh, Again, as a reminder, let's go back a bit. I've, uh, I've been proposing child care subsidies and increases the last six years. Um, many times the legislature has cut those proposals and not moved forward with that. But we've, we've actually doubled our, our, our um, provisions for, for child care uh, since then. And the proposal I put forward in the budget uh, for this year uh, raises a, another 56 million uh, on top of what we already do. So that makes it about you know, 120 million dollars. I'd say that's pretty substantial. So 
we feel um, with the, and that includes those at the 400% of poverty level uh, that will be included. Now, again, I believe it's the Senate uh, that came up with a proposal that includes 600%. Um, so it's the same path forward in, in you know, when you look at uh, the same, the, the proposal we made and the Senate has made, um, it's just theirs is more generous. I mean, just going to the 600% versus the 400%. So it, it feels as though, from my standpoint, uh, that we have a path forward, um, and then we, I, I believe we should do it in steps so we don't have to raise taxes in order to do so. And I guess last thing on that, I mean, do you, have you heard any chatter in this legislative session about regulation? Child care facilities, as you know, I mean, eight, 10 years ago, a lot of mom and pop shops closed because of increased regulation. Has that been a, a question that, that you've been hearing or anything that, that your office isn't fielding from the Well, I, I may, again, refer to Secretary Samuelson on that. But, uh, but obviously, um, this has been a, an area that we've been fully involved in, with uh, over the years. And, and, but I haven't specifically heard about their proposals in the, in the legislature. Uh, Secretary Samuelson, anything you can add to the conversation? No, Governor, we haven't heard those specific um, proposals. We'll need to, to loop back to you. Governor, on the subject of legislative compensation, um, the Senate is um, amended or is going to be amending uh, a proposal that would essentially increase lawmaker pay uh, by, by um, increasing the length of time it would take to do so to four years instead of two. Are you familiar with that plan and how do you generally feel about lawmaker pay increases yeah. and benefit increases? I'm not familiar with what they're doing with that bill now. Um, I've said in the past I'm, I'm in favor of uh, increasing their pay as long as they reduce the length of the session. Mm -hmm. I think they can get their work done in 90 days, give them a contract amount. They can increase their pay incrementally, whatever they want to do. But get it done in 90 days because if the real goal is to get more participation, more people running for office, uh, I think the length of the session is probably a bigger issue than the pay. Uh, to have, have, and I've served in the legislature, to go to your employer, I've heard this many, many times, to go to your employer and say, I'd like to run for the legislature. The next question is, how long will you be gone? How long will you be absent? And they say, I, don't, I really don't know. It's somewhere between four months and six months. It could be there's no ending, really, until the budget passes. Uh, I know myself, I've been here since into June, uh, before June maybe 15th or something like that. So um, that prevents a lot of people from running for office. So if they really want, if that's the goal, is to get more participation, then do both. You know, you can increase your pay, but reduce the length of the session. It can be done. Many other states do it. I believe there's an, at least, I don't know, 10, 10, 11 other states that have 90 day sessions. And we're a small state. We should be able to do that. I mean, as someone who served in the legislature for a long time, obviously, is there anything you can think of in, in the way that they go about their business that could shrink the amount of time without losing? the effectiveness of the, of the bills they send to your desk. I mean, you want those things to be well-researched and thoughtful and sure. agreed upon. So well, again, if, you're, that. if you pay, pay more money, right? Yeah. Um, maybe you work five days a week instead of four. Um, maybe you don't take off a week in between. Uh, maybe there's something you have to do. Maybe you have to work later at night, like the rest of us do in, in the private sector. I mean, there's, there's ways to get it done. And maybe you don't take up. Um, some of your time with things that aren't going to, to make it through. You have to prioritize, just like we do in our everyday lives, in our own budgets, our own lives, you have to prioritize. And I think we have to do a better job here. I have a question about um, Vermont's assisted suicide bill. There's a, um, a law, rather. There's a bill to, re to, re to remove the residency requirement so that people from other states could come to Vermont to get that type of care here. Are you familiar with that? I am. Are you supportive of that, yeah, that change? I'm OK with that. You're I'm OK, okay, you're with, okay that. with other people coming to Vermont yeah. to end their lives. Why? 
Well, I just don't think you can shut down the border. Um, I think it's, it's, it's something that has to be open uh, to any and all. I mean, I wouldn't use it as a way to draw more people here. Um, but, um, but at the same time, I don't think the border should um, be the barrier. Um, in your earlier remarks, I thought I heard you say that you thought the legislature, you and the legislature were on the same page about universal paid family leave. Yeah. Do I have that right? Because universal is the modifier that they use for their plan. Right. And are you now coming around to the no, I think universal what, meaning? What I've said uh, all along, um, and I don't know as I, I, maybe I haven't articulated it as well as, uh, as I should have, but I've said we need to create a structure. We need a framework. And there's nothing better than what we're trying to do, a voluntary type of program to start with, uh, creating a structure that where we don't have to build out a bureaucracy here in the government. We don't have to hire 60, 70 people to oversee it. We don't have to have an IT system. We don't have to, to get a, you know, establish a, a capital reserve to fund it. We can do this in the private sector. They already do this work. They, they do it every day. So we're doing this right now. We have a plan we're, we're moving forward with uh, for our state employees that's going to do just that. So we've, we just want to expand that. And so let's, let's do that. It's going to take their, every proposal I've seen from the legislature is going to take three, four years to implement. And I'm saying, let's do the voluntary path. Let's establish what works, what doesn't, and then maybe we can cater uh, the, the plan for Vermont as we learn more about it with what we're doing with state employees and so forth. And then in three or four years when the revenue, hopefully, in the state continues to grow, if we bring more people in, um, then you can make it universal. You can, you can pay for it. You can pay for it out of existing dollars, uh, but I, but I think eventually, I think that's the path forward. I think, I think everyone should have it, but I don't think that that's what it, it's always about the how. I just don't think we can do everything they want to do in one year. You can't have paid family leave and child care and some of the other provisions all in one year. I think it has to be staged over a number of years. And what they're doing is it's going to take three or four years to put their plans into place, and we're still going to be paying for it and not receiving the benefit. Ours actually get to try it out. Thank you. Uh, Governor, the House gave pre preliminary approval to 16-year-old local voting in Brattleboro. <clears throat> Your thoughts on that? I think I vetoed something similar to that previously. I don't think my thoughts have changed much on it. Uh, also, uh, critics of S-37 say that it has no minimum age limits for puberty blockers or sex reassignment surgery. Now that our Constitution assures reproductive liberty, are you concerned that standards of care uh, could shift to allow middle schoolers to elect surgery over the wishes of their parents? What's S-37? The um, uh, gender reassignment and uh, and uh, abortion and transgender uh, it's services. It's essential shields providers from professional organizations for delivering all reproductive care. Got it. And did that pass the Senate? Then is it in the House now? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, I I can't pretend to know all the intricacies of that bill. Um, I can certainly. Uh, I we can confer with my my cabinet members, those who are involved in it, and then go from there. But I, I don't, I guess I can't comment on that at this point in time. The House Corrections and Institutions Committee has had some lengthy debate this session about the women's correctional facility up north um, and plans to build a new facility, how many beds should be in it, the whole gamut. Where do you, I mean, I know it's down the line still, we're early in talks on this, but where do you stand right now? I think we proposed it. We put it in the bill. So that the number, I, th I think it was 100 and I'm going to guess 130 beds, something like that facility. 
I mean, we've known for quite some time that, um, and, and this was back in my days in the Senate, uh, that we needed to do something to upgrade uh, the women's facility in particular. We, I went for field trips there with my committee and uh, got to see it with our own eyes and, and thought we could, should do better. Uh, there's the main model uh, that uh, appears to be uh, the best approach that we've seen thus far. So I'm in favor of moving forward with something. That's what we put in the bill. Hopefully the legislature will agree. So back in February, the Vermont State Colleges made what became a pretty controversial decision, moving physical libraries and books, and they wanted to go fully digital. And there's a Senate bill, uh, they're receiving testimony today, that the Vermont um, State Colleges would have to go through the legislature to be able to make any changes, to whether it's the libraries, cut librarians' hours. Because what are your thoughts that a university might have to go through the general assembly? I think it's a terrible changes? idea. I, I think that might type of micromanaging, when we're telling them you got to live within your means, you got to figure out how you're going to support yourself without uh, more money from the legislature. There, we passed this last year. The, the goal was they were supposed to save, I think, another $5 million this year. And I'm not saying that, that, that what they did was the right thing to do, but we can't micromanage. If we're going to give them a directive, can't micromanage that. You have to let them figure out what the best, best path forward is for them. Uh, I believe we have Tom Davis from Compass Vermont on the line. We had you unmuted for a second. It looks like you remuted yourself, Tom. Yeah, we're not hearing you, Tom. I think you're you're talking, but we're not hearing you. I'm sorry. Is Ed Barber from the Newport Daily Express on? Tom, feel free to, if you have a question, send it to me. We can get a response to you this afternoon. Thank you. I had no questions. Thank you. <laughs> we did hear that. <laughs> I'll take the gold star. All right. <laughs> you got it. Any others in the room? Did you have a nice Easter? I'm sorry? Did you have a nice Easter? Yes, yes. Took a hike up the hill um, next to our, our house, and that was a beautiful day. Uh, Governor, it's been reported that during the swatting incident at the Middlebury Library, police outside could not communicate with police inside due to problems with the $12 million BCOM communication system. Some first responders say it's too complicated to train workers and that accessing it on cell phones is difficult. Any, any thoughts about this? Yeah, I'm, I know uh, I've heard some of the same thing uh, that you're describing, but I don't have any details at this point. I'm sure we'll get to the bottom of it. first year hearing of issues with the VCOM system, or has this been ongoing? Well, dur during the pandemic, actually, when we were transitioning uh, to this, this new system, uh, there was some complaints during the transition, but I hadn't heard of any since, to be honest with you. Is it concerning for you at all that you have heard these concerns? Well, I'm, no, I mean, obviously, we want people to be able to communicate uh, during those types of situations. So. Again, I have complete faith in our Department of Public Safety and our commissioner, and I'm sure they'll get to the bottom of it and fix it. If, if the House doesn't restore the 25 unit Act 250 exemption for housing, is that a deal killer? Is that a veto thing? You know, I, I'm. I've been saying for quite some time uh, that we need to do something about Act 250, and, and if we're really serious about about housing, uh, then and if this is really truly a crisis, uh, then we better address it like it's a crisis and and do something about this provision. Um, VLCT uh, has some issues with it. I don't know if they're supportive of this uh, at this point in time, uh, but there are so many good parts of the bill. I wanted to acknowledge that. It's in the House now. Uh, they have the ability to fix it and uh, make it so that all of us can support it 
and move forward. Governor, on the subject of EVs, I think we're really about to see EV sales take off in the state of Vermont, but in the past you've expressed concern that um, uh, they may not be paying their way uh, to keep uh, Vermont's roads up to snuff uh, because they're not paying gas taxes. Do you have a solution for how to make sure that those drivers uh, contribute to the state's road network? Well, we, um, again, I, I'm fully supportive of the transition to EVs, as you know. I uh, have one as a daily driver myself. Uh, we have to continue. We are really um, on the forefront of providing for the infrastructure, charging infrastructure, and so forth, and we need to continue to grow that and having faster chargers, more of them in more parts of the state as we transition to this uh, electric technology. Um, so at the same time, I think we're about 6% of the sales at this point, and I believe it will grow. I mean, we're seeing more and more manufacturers that are coming out with some pretty, uh, pretty um, ingenious uh, type of uh, vehicles. So we'll, um, but having said that, as we grow and, and continue to, to have more EVs, there has to be a user fee. We have to pay for our roads and bridges and maintenance and so forth somehow. Um, so we put forward a mileage tax uh, in uh, the house. Uh, I think, I believe that passed or was included uh, and, uh, and now it's in the Senate. Uh, I know that they had uh, some issues with that and they'd like to see that it uh, be, um, be imposed. They're not disagreeing that it needs to happen but they'd like to see it imposed at the pump, so to speak, at the charging station, just like we do with, with fuel. I'm in favor of that, but we've been told by the utilities uh, that they are not, they, they can't do it at this point in time. If they can, if they figure it out, I think that does make the most sense. Uh, that way uh, we, can, uh, we can take advantage of those who are coming to visit our state, they're using our roads too, and pay, uh, as well as uh, making sure that uh, for monitors are, are treated appropriately. Is there an argument to be made for not doing that uh, so that people are more incentivized to buy an EV, which is still a little more expensive than, than a gas-powered vehicle? Well, again, I'm all, always in favor of tax reductions, of uh, fee reductions, but in this case, again, we need, that's the way, and I believe that the, the country has to come to grips with this as well. That's the way we pay for our highways, our bridges and roads and so forth is through fuel. So if it's, I don't see how we can do without it. Um, we're going to have to, to make some decision on this uh, sooner rather than later. And again, I think uh, the country needs to do so as well. One last follow up on that. I mean, can, can our grid support these EV charging infrastructure investments across the state? plus what we might see acquired by, or, or incentivized by S5, if that passes? Yeah, I'm, uh, as you know, I've been, I've been concerned about the grid. Uh, and when I went to, to uh, Washington, D.C. for the National Governors Association, we had a panel discussion about things of this nature. And so we are going to have to do some more planning. We, we need uh, more battery storage, large-scale battery storage. And, in strategic places. Uh, we're going to have to upgrade the grid. I think Velco has talked about this. I've had conversations with them as well. So we can't, um, I, I think we can handle the, the infrastructure, the charging infrastructure at this point in time. Um, but when we start adding more heat pumps and so forth, and when you try and uh, uh, renovate or uh, re reconfigure your, your home to allow for charging at home, um, that has an impact on the grid as well. Transformers have to be upgraded and so forth. So it gets to be a pretty expensive. So again, we need to look at this holistically across the state. We're doing, um, our uh, public service department is doing just that, uh, and Velco as well, and, and I believe the utilities uh, are uh, our partners in this um, as we move forward. But, but it, it is a critical issue. That's why it has to be done in stages and steps. It can't be done overnight. One question I've pondered with the EV mileage-based fee proposal is how 
that would factor into someone who drove outside of the state, say they took a cross country yeah. trip or a college kid who lives out of the state for most of the year. I, I'm sure you've thought about that. Yeah, no, it's not a perfect system, admittedly. Um, but it's the only one we could come up with at this point in time uh, to provide the resources we need to maintain our roads and bridges. Um, so again, as I said, if there is a, um, if technology changes or the utilities say we can actually do this and charge uh, some sort of fee or tax on uh, the per kilowatt tax of some sort, uh, then that would be uh, probably more appropriate. And I believe, again, uh, across the country, that's what we're going to have to move towards. But I don't know when they can do it. So we decide to move forward with this and make the proposal. Thank you all very much.